everyone for coming to uh, this uh, lunch symposium. Uh, it's going to be put on by Covidian. <clears throat> I think we have a, a nice agenda for everyone. It's good to see everyone uh, getting out and, uh, uh, for the conference here. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Definitive LE and specific things about Definitive LE. I know you've heard a talk earlier about it, but we're going to talk about the diabetics and the critical limbs in uh, Definitive LE because it's a very important sub portion of this uh, study, I think, uh, uh, when we look at treating these people. <clears throat> and, then doc and then we're going to have a little discussion about uh, crossing complex lesions and total occlusions. We've already seen some at this conference on the live cases, and, uh, but we're going to have a little discussion on uh, techniques and how to, uh, some of the devices that we have to uh, cross those things. So without further ado, I'm going to get started <coughs> on the, uh, let's see, on the critical limb ischemic data for uh, diabetics and definitive LE. <clears throat> and if you look at the diabetic population uh, worldwide, it is on the rise. And, and you can see what we've done as uh, the US has uh, westernized the other countries out there. If you look at the amount of diabetes that's, that's there, it's incredible the rise of it. Uh, in terms of China, I have never been there, but I've heard some of my friends say that there's a McDonald's on every corner now. Uh, and, and this is why we have this problem to date uh, worldwide, really, not just isolated to the U.S. So what's the impact of diabetes? Well, as we talked about, it's predicted to double by two, 20, 000, or 2030. Uh, type 2 diabetes, which is really related to obesity, is, accounts for about 90% of these cases. Over half, greater than 60% of these non-traumatic amputations occur in diabetics. <clears throat> it's a leading cause of other comorbidities, blindness, renal failure, and certainly cardiovascular deaths are the leading cause of deaths, way beyond cancers in, in this country and, in, and even in the world. And more importantly, as we have this discussion about health care uh, costs, if you look at it, $465 billion spent worldwide on diabetic health related issues. It's really an epidemic and, and really working at causing a, a crisis on, worldwide. So what is CLI? It's advanced PAD resulting in breakdown of skin essentially. <clears throat> and we classify these in either Fontaine or Rutherford. More commonly it's Rutherford class 4, 5, and 6. Uh, 4 being rest pain, uh, 6 being deep tissue wounds, 5 being more superficial wounds. And with one, within one year, amputation rates are very significant, 30% major amputations. And more importantly, mortality rates are extremely high in this group. Because again, if you look at the comorbidities that's out there, these, these people are very, very ill patients. And that 30% amputation rate, I think, is probably varies in, 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 in a lot of uh, places, depending upon how you treat these. A lot of these patients will have upwards of even 50 and 60% amputation rates. So why endovascular therapy for critical limb? Historically, it's been surgical uh, over the years, what's done, but uh, really endovascular therapy has come uh, to the forefront of treating the CLI patient. And this is, this is a, a, amongst all uh, disciplines of medicine, whether it be vascular surgery, cardiology, interventional radiology, and now even interventional uh, nephrologists. But uh, most of these patients are poor operative candidates, as you see, because the the uh, comorbidities, there is poor conduits in many of these cases, wound complications, 15 to 25% for surgical wounds, very lengthy, prolonged hospital stays in these patients, and certainly higher mortality rates in, uh, in these patients. So directional atherectomy is one of the fir uh, first ones that uh, really came out for, for treating below the knee disease. And here's the uh, Turbohawk and Silverhawk used for this. And the nice thing about it is, is it's directional. You can uh, uh, sort of uh, get to the actual lesions, especially in many of these eccentric lesions. So this is definitive LE, and this is really a landmark study that, that came out. It's a large uh, trial that we've talked about already, over 800 patients. Uh, and just the overview, I know you've heard about it, so I'm not going to uh, belabor it. But if you look at it, there's pre-specified diabetics and non-diabetic patency analysis as well as critical limb patients. And this is important. It's not retrospectively looking backwards at a study. It's prospectively looking forward to it, which adds a lot more power and credence to the, to the data that you're going to see. So the eligibility criteria, you had to be Rutherford class 1 through 6. 
as you can see, the uh, greater than 50% stenosis, and then the exclusions were severe calcium instent and aneurysmals. Now this was the study design. If you look at the 800 patients out there, 201 of them were ran, uh, placed in the critical limb, Rutherford class four through six. So this is the group that we're gonna be really concentrating on here today. And we looked at freedom from major unplanned amputations at 12 months, because that's the end point that we're really looking at. De baseline demographics, and again, not surprising if you look at the claudicans versus the critical limbs. Critical limbs usually are more frequently diabetics, as you can see, more frequently have other comorbidities such as renal insufficiency. And the claudicans usually are more commonly smokers. So SFA disease in the claudicans more likely critical limb is usually below the knee. If you look at core lab reported, and this is the aspect of this study that, that, that really has to be repeated. This is not randomized, but this is core lab adjudicated, both by angiography as well as by ultrasound. So this is, this is good core lab data that we're looking at uh, uh, to, to follow up on. So if you, again, if you look at the critical limb ischemia patients, uh, the mean length were very, uh, fairly lengthy lesions at 7.2, and occlusions uh, were more frequently in the critical limb ischemia, so total occlusions. And again, if you look at the, the demographics of the, the lesion areas itself, more frequently critical limbs are going to be below the knee, claudicans are usually going to be more frequently above the knee, and that's, that bears out in this uh, baseline uh, characteristics. So in the claudicant cohort, uh, a total of 743 lesions of those 600 patients, mean length 7.5, with baseline stenosis greater than 70%. And if you look at the uh, restenosis rates with PSVR of less than 3.5, it's 82, and P PSVR of less than 2.4 is 78%. Uh, PSVR of less than 2.4 is really more frequent in the literature, so this is one we're gonna really sort of go by in that sense, because it, 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 although it's hard to compare uh, non-randomized apples to apples, but uh, PSVRs of 2.4 is usually the typical what we see amongst the literature out there. So if you look at, break this down into the diabetic population, because that's really what we're gonna be looking at, diabetics <clears throat> and the critical limbs. So again, if you look at the baseline demographics of them, Diabetics are going to usually be sicker patients, the, and these are the ones that we're going to be seeing for the critical limbs. If you look at it, more frequently they have angina, more frequently they have renal insufficiency uh, and, and hypertension. So they are usually a more, a more significant comorbidities associated with these, and that's why these patients are more difficult, especially in the surgical aspects of it, because of all these comorbidities. If you look at uh, the primary patency rates, between diabetics and non-diabetics. Now, you know, when we, when we first started doing this study, we always, our, our, my impression, I think many people's impression is, diabetics have higher restenosis rates. We know that from the surgical and, and coronary interventional programs where if you had three vessel disease and you were diabetic, patients probably did better with surgical over, than, over stenting in that degree versus the non-diabetics. So diabetics typically, at least in the coronary world, Restenosis more frequently, and that's where you would switch over the envelope maybe to surgery over endovascular. But if you look at patency rates here, again, diabetics and non-diabetics, 77% versus 78%. And this, again, if you look at the days on the bottom, goes out one full year, and this is we're talking about, again, the PSVR of 2.4. So that correlates to about a 50% lesion for those that, that uh, don't know that based on that. So very good patency rates amongst diabetics and non-diabetics. And if you think about that, maybe balloon angioplasty causing more disruption to the, the uh, adventitial or endothelial areas uh, because diabetics have usually more of an inflammatory response. So the aspect of atherectomy removing plaque out of there without causing so much barotrauma or anything else to the vessel may make much more sense, and that may be why these diabetics do better. Now, if you look at the CLI patients, <clears throat> baseline Rutherford class, as you look here, and again, it's not just Rutherford class four rest pains. The majority of these patients had wounds, if you look at there, and 10% even had deep tissue wounds. So a fair majority of these patients did have very significant critical limb and a higher incidence of going on to have primary or amputations down the road. 
So if you look at the CLI cohort, freedom for major amputation at 12 months was 95%. Now remember those numbers that we talked about before, 30% historically across the board. And again, I would, I, I would say that probably even a little bit higher because of this cohort being the, the Rutherford, predominantly the Rutherford class five and six, the more uh, uh, wounds in that degree. So 95% freedom of major amputation rates at 12 months. And again, that's a very good number if you look at the across the board. So how does the data look stratified by diabetic status in these patients? So if you look at definitive LE with diabetes and definitive LE without diabetes, limb salvage rates, fairly equivalent again. And again, diabetics versus non-diabetics do very, very well in this cohorts. How do you compare it to other treatments? Well, the basal trial, which looked at the PTA limb, again, 71%. Basal bypass limb, 68%, and uh, the pulley, 75% with the hepar-coated uh, grafts. So if you look at this, this does very well. Again, it's not, you know, it's different studies, but I think this is a very dramatic difference because very similar uh, case mix in terms of what we had uh, on those patients. So if you look at wound healing critical limb, Rutherford class five and six, 52% at three months, 61% at uh, six months, and 72% complete wound healing at one year. Oops, did I go backwards? No, so let me go back here. I thought I had that. So how does it look stratified to diabetic status? Again, on the wound healing, if you look at 75% uh, for the uh, with diabetics, without diabetes, 66%. And how does it compare across the board from these other studies, again, with surgical and stenting? Very, very favorably in that sense. So again, a procedure that probably has less morbidity and mortality related to it over surgical areas, uh, very, very favorable in, in wound healing. Not just limb salvage, wound healing. So what are the pr primary patency rates for critical limb patients in these? So a total of 279 lesions and with uh, mean stenosis of 76%, and again, lengthy lesions, 7.2 centimeters, 71% patency rate at one year. And again, if you look at the CLI cohort, patency of limb salvage, uh, and again, you see the blue line on top, 95% limb salvage at one year. If you look at primary patency rate, 71%, as we talked about, and secondary patency rate of 88%. Now, the other thing that I think is important, if you look across the board at all studies, whether you do angioplasty, surgery, atherectomy, any type of limb salvage studies out there, patency does not correlate with limb salvage. You will see as, as time goes on, it's the important aspect of that first three to six months. So if you look here out to 180 days, that's six months, if you look at patency rates, they're pretty doggone good. That's where you're gonna be healing probably more of your predominant wounds or uh, gaining limb salvage in these patients. So normally if you look at uh, curves such as this in limb salvage versus patency rates, patency rates go way down as you get out to one year. Limb salvage rates stay plateaued out there. Once, they, once you salvage the limb at six months, typically there's gonna have a good salvage rate there. So again, patency is very, very good in these, but it's, it's, it's uh, the important aspect is limb salvage as well too. So primary patency rates by vessels, as you can see, for again, the PSVR of less than 2.4, um, all of the 279 lesions, 71%, but if you look down in there, infrapopliteal. Now again, surprising data us. Well, we would have thought smaller vessels more diabetic vessels down below the knee, much higher restenosis rates, but surprisingly, our infrapopliteal had nearly an 80% patency rate at one year compared to the SFA. And again, fairly lengthy lesions, although they were a little bit longer in the SFA, but very, very good patency rates. So I think in summary, directional atherectomy has shown, especially in definitive LE, that you have very good limb salvage, and that's what we're really talking about in these patients. So these are the most critical, critical patients that we're gonna be treating and interventionally and as a team approach as well too, in terms of uh, limb salvage, wound healing, you know, the diabetic management, the whole gamut that goes into this. And the interventional part of it's the, the, a very important piece of it. But as we do this, if we have good tools and techniques that we can actually achieve good outcomes and good results, 
And again, core lab adjudicated results on these things where, where uh, we have uh, the, the results that have been shown here for patency, limb salvage, and wound healing. I think these are very, very important aspects for us uh, to carry forward. And uh, I think gives credence to the aspect of interventional therapy really does work for these patients and more importantly can re be reapplied as time goes on because these patients, as you know, once limb salvage is achieved, we have another battle to fight usually down the road. So this is why I think that this, this works very, very well from the long term and the short term. So thank you very much. So we're going to move on to uh, talk about uh, uh, difficult uh, crossing lesions. We've, like I said, we've already seen one. Dr. John Wiscott's going to be uh, up next to talk about this. He's the medical director of the cardiac cath lab at the University of Mississippi and has uh, some great uh, uh, techniques and uh, uh, topics on uh, crossing total occlusions. Thank you, Tom. That was an excellent review of the Defender of LE data for critical limb. Um, I'm from Mississippi and everything we do down there right, uh, revolves around food, so I'm very comfortable talking to you while you eat. Pretty much every conference I give, somebody's eating. So, um, We're going to talk a little bit about uh, critical limb and what my passion is and what makes the major up the majority of my practice um, is the treatment of critical limb. And uh, that was a great segue looking at the definitive LE data. In the last year, um, with my practice, what we've had is the definitive LE data which were presented at Viva last fall, which basically proved what the, the way I've been practicing for four or five years, which is directional atherectomy as first line for critical limb. And what we've seen in our practice, um, could I get my slides up, please? Um, ah, thank you. Um, what I've seen in my practice is definitely the same success rate that was seen uh, in the critical limb arm of definitive LE. So what we're gonna do today is just talk a little bit about uh, the fact that endovascular should definitely be first line management of critical limb ischemia. When we talk about two catheters that we've uh, been able to acquire in the last year from Covidian, which was the, is the Viance and the Interior catheters, which have really revolutionized the way we treat chronic total occlusions in my lab, and especially utilizing alternative access. And I know that's been talked about some at this meeting, that uh, pedal access and other alternative access sites should become pretty much standard for any endovascular therapist who's going to treat CLI, and I would definitely uh, echo that. We're going to look at some of the comparison of these catheters with some of the other catheters that are available on the market. Look at the PFAS study. I'm going to show you some case examples of how we've been able to use these catheters, uh, especially from alternative access sites that has really improved our success rate with healing wounds. This has already been reiterated. I'm not going to, uh, to repeat it, but what I just want to say is that if, if you're doing critical limb, you're going to be treating CTOs, period. And if you're treating CTOs, you really need to put alternative access in your toolbox. And the catheters I'm going to show you today will allow you to use these same catheters through alternative access sites. And I think that's really important for treating critical limb. We know about the treatment challenges of treating CTOs, um, how difficult they are to cross, especially below the knee. Um, and I'm not going to reiterate that. That's been uh, uh, emphasized in this meeting already. We know that uh, most chronic total occlusions are more than three months old. There's a lot of different makeup of the plaque morphology that's in these vessels. There's some thrombus, there's a lot of calcium, there's fibrotic plaque, and this can make it very difficult to cross, especially in heavily calcified lesions. So my strategy for crossing a CTO is, first of all, you want to take a full set of angios. Always take a full set of angios all the way to the toes before you ever start. Look for delayed filling of these vessels. Remember, a lot of these vessels, especially the tibials, will feel retrograde from collaterals. And so the occlusion may not be quite as long as you think it is on first um, impression because the vessel actually feels retrograde from a perforator collateral off the, the perineal or some uh, other collateral. Um, I really like to selectively engage a collateral and fill it really well, or pacify it really well, and see if I see any native vessels filling distally, especially at the foot, because the pedal arch can really hiber hibernate. And if you can get a vessel that's a collateral and inject, inject directly into that vessel, a lot of times you will see uh, digital vessels in the toes or a pedal arch that you didn't otherwise see just injecting from the knee or even from the groin. Um, you want to define the inflow, the outflow of the CTO, and go ahead and plan your access. 
and identify your distal target. Of course, I believe in the angiosome concept. Wherever the wound is, you need to try to open up the tibial that supplies that angiosome. Um, but if that's not possible, you're going to shoot for the easiest target you have in a CTO. You want to commit. Before you try to cross the CTO, you want to go ahead and put your supportive sheath in, either crossover, anagrade, whatever it is you're going to use. Go ahead and commit to that. Don't try to cross with just a support catheter and a wire without putting your supportive sheath in to start with. I'm a big believer in taking a picture with a, a support catheter right on the cap. I'm going to show you an example of that in just a minute. But I think if you're going to see microchannels, especially in the proximal cap, the best way to do that is to take a selective picture in multiple views right on top of the cap. That will also help you delineate, delineate where the collaterals come off and so you can keep your, uh, your wires or catheters out of the collaterals. Um, go ahead and choose a crossing strategy. I'm going to kind of show you what I use. Um, as far as deciding if I'm going to go with a wire technique or a crossing catheter right off the bat. I believe in definitive LE. I practice it every day. And I think we try to leave the vessel native as, as well as we can. We very rarely put stents in in my lab. Um, but I think if you're going to cross a long CTO and use directional atherectomy um, as your mainstay of treatment and try to get a standalone result with atherectomy, you need to cause as little trauma to that vessel while you're crossing it as possible. And so that's why I like wire techniques and crossing catheter techniques and reentry techniques if needed that are going to be very atraumatic to the vessel because you can often treat with directional atherectomy, shave out your reentry flap and avoid having to put in stent. And I can tell you that since interior launch last fall, we are yet to have to stent a reentry site um, with interior. If the initial strategy for crossing is not working, change, escalate early. Don't stand there and thrash for an hour with one wire and just think it's going to eventually pop in. Um, this is an approach that uh, has been advocated for crossing CTOs. Once you define the CTO, you're going to decide what do you want to do first. Do I want to just poke at it with a glide wire or an 014 wire? Do I want to go ahead and use a crossing device early? Um, do I want to commit to a wire technique, a looped wire technique that's going to get me subintimal and get down to the distal cap and then use a reentry catheter such as Outback Pioneer or Interior? Um, you know, they, there's different strategies you can use. And what I do is I like to take a picture at the, distal, at the proximal cap and make my decision then. How long is the CTO? How much calcium is present? Is the cap favorable? Is there a lot of collaterals? What about the distal cap? Um, where am I trying to reenter? Do I have a good target for reentry? All those you take into consideration before you plan your initial strategy. So this is an example of a fairly complex cap. You can see um, that the... Uh, the cap you would think might be here, and especially if you put just a straight glide wire down that catheter, because of the tortuosity of the vessel, the, catheter, the wire is going to want to go down this shelf right here. In reality, once you take a rotated view, you can see that this little spot right here is where you really want to reenter. So I like to deliberately choose where you engage the cap. In this particular case, we used a Viance in that cap right there and cross this occlusion in about 30 seconds in the lumen. Um, and you can see this is a standalone atherectomy result. So um, this is pretty typical for cases in our lab and just I think is a good example of how if you will cross the occlusion as atraumatically as possible, you can get really stent-like results with directional atherectomy um, without having to put a stent in. So I'm going to introduce you to the Viance and interior catheters. The Viance is the crossing catheter. Um, it is an 037 distal tip, so the nice thing about that is you can introduce it through any catheter with an 038 lumen. So a trailblazer or a quick cross support catheter will allow you to introduce that. So that's really nice for alternative access strategies. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Um, it works by a spin, manual spin. It has this modified torquer that you use just to spin the catheter. And it has a wire lumen that's 014 which is really nice because it allows you to use different stiffness of wires depending on how aggressive you want to be. Um, I typically start with a medium wire, like a Miracle 4 or 6, um, but you can start with a more flexible wire, like a workhorse wire, and even progress up to something like a Confienza or Confienza Pro um, to really give a lot of stiffness to the tip of the catheter. And it also provides some steerability to the catheter at the end. I guess the video is not going to play. I'll try one more time. Try clicking it twice. 
There we go. So, um, so this is the catheter engaging the cap, and the, um, you spin the handle, and this catheter is good at finding microchannels. So little soft spots in that proximal cap that will allow the catheter to cross the proximal cap, which is the most difficult part of a CTO usually. Um, and it just weaves its way through the microchannels. I like to spin the catheter back and forth, so counterclockwise and, counter and clockwise, alternating about every four or five seconds. But I also will use the friction of directing your spinet to direct which way the tip is going. Um, that allows you, if you see the catheter tend to favor the medial or lateral side of the vessel, you can then spin it the opposite way and get it to kind of steer back the other way. If it won't steer that way, you can use a wire ahead of it um, to, steer the, to steer the catheter. So the nice thing about Viance, there's no capital equipment, so it's just a catheter you pull out of a box. There's no um, power equipment to buy or, or uh, imaging equipment to buy. It's very simple to use and learn. There's two models. Um, I tend to use the flexible model below the knee and the standard model in the SFA popliteal and, and uh, uh, common femoral. It is, like I said, very low profile with an 037 lumen, so that you can introduce it through any catheter with an 038 lumen. It's very safe, very traumatic. If you perforate the vessel with this catheter, it's basically the same size hole as you would with a, with a 035 glide wire. So very unlikely to cause a wire type perforation that's gonna be a problem for the patient and you can't seal up with a prolonged balloon inflation. Um, it does not expand the subventable space. And I think this is really important, especially if you're gonna use interior for reentry should you get to the distal cap and be subintimal, it's very important not to expand that subintimal space and get way away from the lumen, especially at the distal cap. Um, and that will oftentimes happen when you use either larger crossing catheters um, or looped wire techniques. Allows you to use any 014 wire to vary the stiffness of the catheter. It's adequate working length, so you can use crossover technique and still use it all the way to the ankle because um, it's 150 working length um, in the flexible. And um, it's very versatile. And I'm going to demonstrate to th that to you with some cases here in a minute. But we've been able to introduce this catheter through just about any access you can imagine. Um, and it's worked really well for us. And of course, we're all aware of cost effectiveness of medicine right now. And as far as crossing catheters go, it's on the low end of the cost. And again, no capital equipment to purchase. So just to compare um, with some other crossing catheters on the market, like I said, the thing that I think that sets Viance apart is the no capital equipment. It's very low crossing profile and it's just really simple to use. And what I'm going to show you today is it's just extremely versatile in how you can introduce it uh, into a CTO. Like I said, the, when you're first learning to use Viance, it's all about the spin. It's not about push. So you're trying to find these micro channels. You're using orthogonal displacement of friction by spinning the catheter. And so if you're at the proximal cap, it's not uncommon to just sit there and spin for a couple minutes before it actually penetrates through the proximal cap. Then once it goes, it usually goes very quickly through the softer part of the occlusion. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, I think I've said most of this already, but it, the nice thing about it is it's available um, you can use it above and below the knee. And so the larger, bulkier devices, I think, are not very well suitable um, for tibial crossing and tibial reentry. Um, and so I think these catheters have a very unique role, um, both in crossing below the knee occlusions and in the ability to introduce it through alternative access. So tips and tricks with a Viance. Like I said, I really like to take a selective picture on top of the cap. Uh, deliber deliberately choose where the catheter engages the cap. I think it's really important to go ahead and choose where you want to engage the cap. Use a wire to direct you into that particular spot and spin right there. Um, if there's a micro channel in the distal cap, kind of like the, the, the case I showed earlier, I really like to get a wire started into that micro channel and then ride the viance in through over that wire into, and engage the cap and then let the viance lead ahead of the wire. Um, after that. And I really like a Fielder XT for, for selecting those micro channels because of the 009 tapered tip and the uh, hydrophilic tip. Um, I usually start with a medium stiffness wire such as a Miracle 4 or 6. Um, like I said, it's all about the spin. You're, you don't really have to push this catheter hard unless it's in a lot of calcium. I like to alternate which way I rotate, clockwise and counterclockwise frequently. Um, lead with the wire if you need to to direct it. If you really need a lot of extra support, this is not very common, but if you really need a lot of extra support in a really heavily calcified vessel, sometimes you can actually 
introduce it through a support catheter, even though you already have a crossover sheath in. That gives you a lot of, a lot of support, a lot of push. And then when you get to the distal cap, if you're not in the lumen, you can redirect the viands toward the lumen with like an, a, a stiff tipped wire like a confienza. And oftentimes it will pop through that distal cap um, if you just redirect it right at the distal cap. So if you get down to the distal cap with the viance and you're still subintimal and you can't get in with a wire, um, we have the interior catheter. And what I think is really nice about the interior catheter is it's very low profile um, and you're able to introduce it to the distal vessel. So it is a flat balloon. For those of you who do coronary CTOs, it's similar to the Stingray balloon. Um, but it is a flat balloon. with two wire lumens and it inflates in the subintimal space and then you're able to direct the reentry wire 180 degrees apart. So you rotate your camera to where you can see the balloon beside the vessel as far away from the, the lumen as you can and then you see which direction you want the wire to be directed and you insert the wire, direct it that way and then you make a stabbing motion with the wire. And I'm going to show you some examples of this in a minute and that will re-enter into the true lumen and then you remove the balloon, advance either an 014 balloon or an 014 crossing catheter into the distal vessel. Now you have wire control of the vessel. A very elegant way to re-enter a distal vessel when you're subintimal. So again, very low profile, no capital equipment. It's available in two sizes. I tend to use the 375 balloon and the common femoral, um, the SFA and the popliteal and the 275 balloon um, below the knee. Sometimes in a larger TP trunk, you might use the uh, larger balloon. Um, again, very versatile. You can introduce it through alternative access. Um, the package insert does say five French catheter, but it will go through a four French. So if you need to get um, this balloon through a tibial, um, you do not have to put a five French sheath in. Very safe, very atraumatic, does not expand the subintimal space. Like I said, a very elegant way to re-enter a distal vessel without causing a lot of trauma to a vessel that you're trying to leave as native as possible. Um, the catheter is available with three different wire strengths, um, a flexible, a standard, and a stiff. I tend to use the standard in just about every case. Um, the stiff wire is very difficult to torque, um, but it can be used if you need it to, to penetrate through some heavy calcium. Um, but I tend to use um, the standard wire in just about every case. And uh, again, for reentry compared to Outback and Pioneer, very competitively priced. And again, a much more vers versatile much more usable below the knee and uh, I think much less traumatic for the vessel um, without having to uh, advance a very bulky catheter all the way through the subintimal space just to re-enter into the distal lumen. So again compared with other catheters I think we've um, uh, said this already except for the working length, I will make this point that it's nice to have a 150 centimeter working length uh, for a reentry catheter. And so that gives you options for reentering tibials, even just with crossover techniques. So you don't have to necessarily uh, have anagrade access um, to treat long uh, tibial occlusions. So tips and tricks with the interior. Um, it's very important, I think, to not expand, overexpand um, the subintimal space of the distal cap. It's really not going to be um, as useful if you have really expanded with like a looped glide wire or a large um, crossing catheter um, that really expands the subintimal space. Um, I like to deliberately choose exactly where I'm going to re-enter, try to avoid calcium, avoid plaque, and of course avoid side branches. Um, you may have to pre-dilate the subintimal track. Um, with like a 2-0 balloon, long 2 balloon to deliver this balloon because it does have that flat profile and it, it will catch a little bit. So sometimes you're going to pre-dilate um, just to deliver the balloon, but that's often not necessary. Um, you want to inflate the balloon before you remove your initial wire. So you've got, say, a confienza down in the distal vessel and that's subintimal, and you're going to deliver this balloon over that wire. Go ahead and inflate the balloon before you pull out that confienza, and that'll help anchor it in place. And then when you advance the, the reentry wire in, the balloon won't move. Um, rotate the camera. I just, you know, you're used to using Outback and Pioneer uh, where you're rotating the camera, and I just rotate the cameras where the balloon looks the furthest away from the lumen it can be, and then direct the wire the opposite direction. I use the standard entry wire in every case, um, unless it just won't go, and then I'll switch to a stiff. 
Um, you're going to gently probe that port to decide which way you want to exit. Once you see that the wire is going the direction you want, you're going to make a short stabbing motion like you're getting arterial access. Um, it's really almost like using a needle uh, to, or to enter the distal lumen. Um, redirect the wire as you need to. It's, you try to spin it away from the lumen, uh, away from the opposite wall of the vessel uh, when you're advancing the wire down. It is a very stiff wire, so you're going to be really careful not to cause any trauma to the distal vessel once you've re-entered into the lumen. Um, and make sure you get enough wire down so when you're backing that balloon off, um, you don't lose wire position and then you get to start over. Um, and that's important because remember this wire is going to be coming out the side port of this balloon. And so there is a lot of friction as you're removing the wire uh, out of the sheath. And so you want to make sure you have good distal wire position before you try to remove the balloon. But we'll quickly go over the PFAS trial, um, which was just uh, a safety and efficacy trial to get the uh, catheters FDA approved. Um, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I want to get to the cases uh, that I have for you today. Uh, but basically, it's a small trial, 105 subjects, 66 patients with CTOs, um, baseline characteristics similar to any, uh, any PAD trial. Um, the length, median length was about 20 centimeters, so long occlusions, mostly uh, SFA and popliteal disease. Um, major adverse rates at 30, at 30 days was very low, uh, with only one perforation in the entire uh, cohort. And um, basically the summary was it was safe and effective for crossing CTOs um, with about an 85% 80 efficacy rate using Viancin and Tear for fairly long occlusions. And I will say that in my personal experience, it's much higher than this, um, but this was a fairly new catheter at the time this trial was done. And this was really the first trial that was done just to get the catheter FDA approved. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you some examples of how we've been using this catheter um, in our lab for treating CLI patients. This was a patient with a very long SFA occlusion um, that actually did have a wound. And you can see that uh, basically just a nub off the common femoral of the SFA, he's got a nice profunda, um, and then it reconstitutes down in the distal vessel at Hunter's Canal, which is very typical, obviously. So about a 250 millimeter occlusion. So we uh, chose to engage the cat with a viance, and you can see um, we were able to cross in the very middle um, of, the, of the cap, and I was very pleased with that. And this is just how the catheter goes down the vessel. Um, so I'm just spinning the catheter back and forth, um, and you can see um, it goes fairly quickly once you cross um, the proximal cap. Um, and I, like I said, I'm just spinning it back and forth, and uh, sometimes changing direction. Just if I think there's no real calcium here to tell you where the lumen is, but it's just kind of a feel thing. And you cross enough SFA occlusions, you kind of know where you need to go. And then I take a picture. Uh, when I get close to where I think the, the, the vessel is going to reconstitute um, and just see how I'm lining up uh, with where I'm going. This is typical with any way you're going to cross the CTO, but I think it's really important with Viance. And you can see it just goes right on down and the wire goes down. And so we crossed, that was about 250 uh, millimeter occlusion that we crossed in probably 90 seconds to two minutes um, with a Viance catheter and uh, really made it look easy. Um, after directional atherectomy, um, this was the result. Um, so nice stent-like result in a long occlusion with just directional atherectomy as a standalone result. Uh, this is a patient who had a flush occlusion off the SFA, I mean off the common femoral, and these can be very difficult as you know. Um, to, you really don't have any idea where the SFA starts. And so um, in this situation, we chose popliteal access. So this is an ejection through uh, the popliteal artery. So we, in these situations, just put a support catheter directly through the skin into the artery. We did not put sheaths in. So this is just an 035 trailblazer um, inserted through the popliteal, and then the viance is coming through the trailblazer. And then you can see, once we got to the common femoral, uh, the viance popped right into the common femoral. The wire went up. And then um, after atherectomy, you can see we got a really great result. So um, nice uh, treatment of a very long occlusion that was occluded osteally off the common femoral that can be very difficult to treat. Uh, this is a case where we use viance and in tier, so fairly long SFA occlusion, about 150 millimeters. Uh, 
Um, you can see it reconstitutes here in the distal vessel. And once we got the viance down, we were just subintimal, and I was just unable to get back into the true lumen with a wire. And so we put the interior balloon down, and you'll see I just popped the wire right through into the true lumen and down, and after this is standalone atherectomy result of an occlusion. What I want to show you here is this is the reentry site. Um, so, like I said, since we've been using interior, I've yet to have to stent a reentry site. So we just reenter with the interior, use a turbo hawk to shave away from the wall and shave out the flap where you reenter, and uh, oftentimes don't even have to put it do a balloon inflation. Um, and you get these, these type results. So really, a very nice atraumatic way to enter the distal vessel that allows you to do directional atherectomy with stent-like results um, without much trauma to the vessel. This is a lady that was a long-time dialysis patient, horrible infrapopliteal disease, um, non-healing wound for several months. Um, and you can see this is her popliteal, and she really has no native vessels um, below the knee. If you see, there's a little lake of dye right there, and we thought that might represent the anterior tibial. Um, and I was able to get a filter started in that, um, and then brought the viance down from above. You can see there's no tibial all the way to the dorsalis pedis. It really reconstitutes right at the ankle. So very difficult to treat. Basically an osteo-occluded anterior tibial that's about a 300 millimeter occlusion. So we tried to get viance down anagrade, and just couldn't do that. And uh, there was just too much calcium and I couldn't stay in the lumen. And so what we elected to do, um, well, we're missing a slide. No, I'm sorry, that's starting. So this is the viance coming down from anagrade, and like I said, we could get it started in the anterior tibial, but just couldn't get it down to the dorsalis pedis and the lumen. So what we elected to do was stick to dorsalis pedis. And so this is, a 035 trailblazer catheter inserted directly into the dorsalis pedis and coming up, and this is the viance catheter coming through um, the trailblazer catheter. So we're going to cross the anterior tibial retrograde. So that's the viance coming up the, the anterior tibial um, at various stages up, uh, and we were able to uh, connect the dots uh, with the wire from the um, anagrade access. And believe it or not, actually it was able to get an 035 glide wire to cross into the trailblazer that was coming from above. So we didn't have to use a snare in this case and just externalize the wire. We had body floss at that point, pulled out our access and uh, used turbo hawk to treat the anterior tibial. And this was our final result. So nice straight line flow to the foot. Um, this, this, this lady has done very well, horrible diabetic, um, end stage renal patient on dialysis, heavily calcified. You can see we end up with straight line flow to the foot um, with just atherectomy. This was a case we did a couple weeks ago um, that was a patient with a horrible wound and he had a common femoral occlusion. What I didn't show you here is he also has a subtotaled external iliac above that. Um, what was a little bit unusual about this particular situation is the common femoral was occluded, the profunda never really reconstituted. Um, the SFA reconstituted after about 60 millimeters or so. And so we tried to get through this uh, common femoral uh, occlusion anagrade, and I just could not direct the catheter uh, into the uh, SFA. It just tended to want to go out these smaller side branches. It was really difficult to see where the SFA was coming off the common femoral. And so what we elected to do was we could see just a, sh a short lake of dye in the mid SFA. And so we entered the mid SFA with a micropuncture kit and um, got access directly into the SFA about mid thigh and came up retrograde. And then just inserted a trailblazer catheter directly through the skin bareback up to the distal cap. So here's an injection through the trailblazer um, into the distal cap. And at that point we just inserted a viance through the trailblazer. And you can see here it's going to just go come up and cross right into the common femoral. You couldn't keep it out if you wanted to. And there's the wire going up. And at that point, we just snared the wire, externalized, and then treated the common femoral with directional atherectomy with TurboHawk um, and got a really nice result. Um, this patient also had a popliteal occlusion that we came back the next week and treated, and he's doing really well. Uh, this is a case that we did um, not too long ago. 
uh, that was really difficult because it was a popliteal occlusion. And I don't know about your practices, but for me, a common femoral occlusion and a popliteal occlusion are two of the hardest occlusions to cross um, just because of the uh, side branches. Um, I was unable to get anything started into this, into this cap um, because of this side branch. Everything just slipped into that collateral, that geniculate side branch. And unfortunately, this patient just had single vessel runoff via a perineal. Um, so anyway, we elected this, he had a wound, and so we elected to go ahead and approach this retrograde. Um, so we actually accessed the perineal artery uh, just above the ankle. Um, so this is a mini stick catheter coming up um, from the perineal vessel. And then inserted an 035 trailblazer and brought a veance up from below. So the veance is coming actually up from the perineal access uh, to the popliteal. Once we got to the popliteal, however, we were again subentimal. You can see the side branch. And so we put in a short four French sheath and used in tear from the perineal access. So here is the wire coming from the perineal up to the popliteal, popping into the true lumen, and then coming up the popliteal into the SFA. At that point, we just exchanged for a friendlier wire, snared it, and then treated the popliteal occlusion um, anagrade, just like we normally would, just pulled the popliteal access out, uh, the perineal access out with a short balloon inflation over the arteriotomy to get hemostasis. And after directional atherectomy, you can see we got a stent-like result. Um, so that concludes what I have um, for critical limb and the use of these crossing catheters through alternative access sites for crossing these difficult CTOs. Um, I think on the heels of the definitive LE data that were treated, I think um, we have really good evidence-based medicine that endovascular therapy with, endo with directional atherectomy should be first-line therapy for critical limb ischemia patients. And to treat with a directional atherectomy, you have to cross. And so I'm hoping that this talk today would help you um, understand just some alternative ways you can use these catheters to cross these very difficult CTOs. We'll stop there, and we'll, I'll uh, open up for any questions. Any questions? While you're thinking of yours, I'm gonna, I just have a comment and a question also as well too. I noticed um, that you, uh, you know, two things. One, take your time at the proximal cap, it seems, and I think that's important. Maybe you can expound on that a little bit more because, uh, you know, I think if, you, if you're too aggressive on that, at least in my opinion, you tend to go subadventitial, and then once you stay, once you're subadventitial, you stay there. And I think the second point I just uh, want to reiterate too, and maybe you can expound on as well too, that distal cap is also the other important spot. Um, if you loop wire these things, you tend to get a bigger area. If you look at IVUS, after you've loop wire and failed to re-enter, and you have to put a re-entry device in there, it almost looks like a bomb has gone off. I mean, it really does look destroyed. You, you have hematomas, perivascular hematomas, and I think that the fact that you're able to, it, when you come down there, and if you you use these devices, they're very small. They create a small channel in there. You really do. You're able to directionally atherectomize them because if you have a big flap there from in your subadventitial area. That, that adventitia gives where the plaque doesn't. And so, especially, a, a, even rotational or, or directional doesn't work there very well, I don't think. Um, whereas if you just got that small area there, uh, you really do get a better, I think, atherectomy device. And you've shown that in your distal, your distal uh, segment where you say you, uh, where you pointed out where you did atherectomy and you're able to do that very nicely. Absolutely, I, I could not agree more. I think that, uh, like I said, I think if you're gonna repeat and have the same results as definitive LE, as successful as that trial was. I think um, if you're gonna try to use standalone therapy, I mean, definitive LE, you had 3% bailout stenting, um, which is probably about what I have in my practice. I, I don't ever put stents in. And um, we get standalone atherectomy results 98% of the time. And uh, I think it's really important, like you said, especially at that distal cap, to cross these occlusions as atraumatically as possible. And I think, um, the more bulky catheters, um, like out back in Pioneer, I think really expand that subentimal space and make it harder uh, to shave out that distal flap and get a stent-like result like you saw in the cases I presented today. I also think that looped wire technique, like you said, I do a lot of IVUS in my peripheral cases, and um, a lot of times we can't even tell where we re-entered with interior with IVUS. It just, it's a it's a, just a beautiful transition into the distal vessel. Um, 
And uh, I think it's really important at the distal cap. Like I said, I think I, I think I tried to make that point as many times as I could, but it's very important not to expand that subintimal space at the distal cap. Um, your point about the proximal cap is also, I think, very important um, to be patient at that proximal cap um, and just let the catheter do its job. Like I said, you're putting the catheter on the distal cap, engaging the cap, and then spinning and spinning and spinning. And you're just using, like I said, orthogonal displacement of friction to try to engage the cap and find that microchannel, that soft spot in that plaque that's going to allow that catheter to penetrate. Um, and if you just, if you lean on that catheter too hard and push it, I think you're using it just like you would a stiff straight glide wire, mm -hmm. which is much more likely to get you, um, like you said, out of the, out of the vessel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's very important. And I've, in heavily calcified diabetic in stage renal patients, I've had cat caps, I've spun eight, 10 minutes at the mm -hmm. top. But then once it pops through that cap, it'll fly down. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a very good point. Yeah, I think Amir's case, I don't know for, for those of you that were watching uh, the case that Amir had done uh, earlier, um, I don't uh, compliment Amir all the time, but I'm going to compliment him here. But uh, the, uh, you know, as you can see, he really ha there's really a few caps in these things, whether it's proximal, mid, distal. And that, the, uh, the crossing device really flew down that, once you cross that, and it seemed like you almost got into a secondary cap there in the mid vessel. I don't know yeah. if that, that's what happened, yeah. but uh, you know, you, you, once you get to those caps, you you just take your time, and, and the uh, the other aspects it'll go very very easy. Is that, and you know, I think your crossing time so it will will decrease as well too. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, none. I guess we will wrap this up then. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone, for staying as well, too. What if there was a way to deliver rapid, safe, and effective hemostasis?